Okay, for a start, it's always weird coming to Brighton. My daughter did a BA and an MA in anthropology here, so coming to Brighton without a carload of luggage, or on one occasion without a battery-driven printer printing off the thesis as we drove to Brighton on last-minute <laughs> alterations. Uh, they say apples don't fall, fall far from the tree, and I'm afraid I tend to do the same thing. Right? Um, what I want to do today is to talk about really the state of Agile, that sort of links in with the pulse we just put together with Gapin Void that I'll also talk about. Um, and in a sense, there's a metaphor here for wider society. That cartoon from Gapin Void tells you an awful lot. Uh, one of the big programs we're involved in at the moment is a citizen journalist program, which we've now experimented with in Wales, Colombia, Malmo, and Wyala. If you don't know where Wyala is, it's in Australia. Um, and Singapore, which we're going to look to go worldwide shortly. And the idea there is that every 16-year-old in every school in the world acts as an ethnographer to their local community working through schools and sports clubs. Because we desperately need human mediation in the technology world in which we live. Uh, the internet, in complexity terms, is an unbuffered feedback loop. And unbuffered feedback loops always tend towards perversity. Yeah, the internet does not connect people, it clusters people in narrow-minded clans. So one of the things we're now looking at is to use the power of technology on a wider basis and to increase human agency within the system. I'm going to be here for about two days, I'm happy to talk about that, but ironically I have to go up to Wembley immediately after that, and I don't think they are carbon, off carbon offsetting, but you know, I've got to do it by train, not helicopter. Um, to talk about human judgment, all right? but I'll be back for this evening. But there's some more stuff going on, and, which is a wider context here. Okay, so let's start this concept of rewilding agile. Rewilding is a current hot topic. Yeah? It's all about reintroducing natural diversity and resilience into the system, where we've over-manicured and over-repaired you know, in terms of formal gardens, agriculture, destruction of nitrogen, yeah, through nitrogen, etc. Uh, this is a prairie wolf. Um, there's probably about three or four types of wild canine, if you actually look at it. Yeah? Not a huge amount of variation. Uh, you can see a common pattern, but it's highly resilient as a species. It's lasted for a long time. When you domesticate canines, you get this. Lots and lots of variety, very little resilience, yeah, and you've lost the natural capability. Now, there's a famous phrase in Tolkien, which you may, may or may not remember, uh, somebody asked about, well, can't you tell the difference between us hobbits? And the elf says, well, doubtless sheep, yeah, unto sheep, other sheep appear different or to shepherds, but we have made no study of them. It's one of the best put-downs in literature. Yeah? From an external perspective, the warring clans of Agile look like that. Yeah? They claim huge amounts of differentiation, but fundamentally, they've lost the initial resilience, which Agile had, because they've actually gone into breed-based competition in which actually whether you can breathe or not doesn't matter so much as whether you've got the right type of stout you know, in terms of the way it works. And I think the issue for us now, and sorry about this, but the new version of iOS has got all sorts of wonderful new features and I'm still a geek at heart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the issue on Agile is like climate warming. It may be too late. We're now into effectively amelioration of things rather than trying to prevent it. And I am actually going to take that position. Uh, the issue is what can we recover, not can we recover. Yeah, so I want to go through that as we go. Um, so let's look at some of the things which are wrong. Firstly, one of my favorite pictures. Yeah? Um, most modern agile is actually yeah, a sheep in wolf's clothing. Right? I, I love that picture. And there are several reasons for that. Uh, one is the paradox of structure and its adoption. Now, I'm going to finish off today's talk with some of the new work we're doing on architecture. We're looking at a typology of scaffolding. Yeah, and that's kind of like one of the big missing things in architecture full stop at the moment. Um, but the trouble is, if you create too much order, you destroy variety. It's kind of like, we, it's the Goldilocks thing. It has to be just right. And kind of like with the method development, and yeah, I partly blame Scrum for this. I think Scrum is a hugely effective technique. I'm going to position it on Kevin, Kevin shortly. But there's sort of a half past out of me which wishes XP had dominated more than Scrum. Um, the trouble is, without Scrum, Agile would have not taken off, and XP people can't talk with ordinary human beings, so they were never going to take off anyway. <laughs> I just thought I'd, I'd hit both with one um, thing on that. I should say, when I said that to Kent Beck, he roared with laughter and then started to talk about guitars, all right? But that's another matter. 
So we have to have structure, but not enough, and I'm going to come back to that. Second is the certification scam. This is going to destroy our job. Yeah, it's basically a pyramid selling scheme. It's a money-making scheme. I've seen people put 18 different sets of letters after the name on the basis they've been on two-day courses. I've got three less sets of letters after my name. They all involve one to five years of study. It involves some decent examinations at it. Right? I know there's a sort of, I've got to do this to get employed sequel, and that's all right. I, I accept I've worked in IBM. I know the necessity to conform with corporate guidelines. But when you start to take it seriously, you've lost your soul. And the soul of Agile has actually been lost to certification scams. Right? And we kind of like got to do something about that. Um, a lot of us are talking at the moment about a new scheme for professionalizing IT based on a proper apprentice transdisciplinary form of learning. But that has to be independent of an individual company. And just part of my own history here, Anybody know the DSDM consortium? Okay, anybody know how it originated? Okay, this was British, all right? So three of us met in a pub in Cheltenham. If we'd been in American, we'd have had a ski resort. I make no metaphor here, all right? <laughs> but we met in a pub in Cheltenham one night and we sorted it out. And it was three deadly competitors. Because we said if as competitors we come together and form a standard, it has a chance of sustainability. If one of us tries to make a standard proprietary, the thing will never spread. Now, Agile made that mistake. They went down proprietary standards, not generalized standards. And again, that's something some of us would like to do something about. Next, too many recipe book users and very few chefs. This is a fundamental metaphor. Um, when I first went to university, I used a recipe book. Yeah, I have lots of recipe books at home now. I don't think I've followed a recipe in 30 years of cooking. Recipes are a source of ideas, but you don't follow them slavishly when you understand the principles of taste. The trouble with the recipe book user is when all the components aren't present, they can't actually execute. And if you look at some of the crazy things I've heard in, you know, in the Scrum community, you haven't done X, therefore you're not doing Scrum. But hang on a minute, it worked. No, but you're not doing Scrum. Yeah, I mean, you cooked this wonderful meal and it actually satisfied people's hunger, but you haven't followed the recipe, therefore I'm not going to eat it. Right? Um, and that, again, is one of the sort of main sort of dangers here. Next one. This is the Spotify heresy. Uh, one which McKinsey's are committing left, right, and center. Uh, you can't start at the end point of somebody else's journey. And there are many reasons for that. First of all, the way we remember the past is different from what actually happened. Sorry about that. We did a lot of work on this in IBM. We actually looked at outsourcing contracts, if you know, outsourcing bid teams. You know, three or four years' work, multi-million dollar budgets, and one day you win or you lose. So we did a lessons learned process the day before they knew whether they'd won or lost and the day after they knew. Identical process, scripted, no variation. You would think you were talking about different universes when you compared the two. The way we remember things if we succeed actually is actually one of the most dangerous forms of memory. I'm going to come back to this later because we now construct the past to actually make us celebrate our success and we forget about all the luck and chance on the pathway. And then actually the way we had a simple rule, all right? So any successful team got broken up. And by the way, that's a very good principle. If a team succeeds at something which has been really hard and very difficult, you should break them up so they can actually filter other teams and not become arrogant. We then look at the teams who'd failed. If the way they described their failure meant they learned from it, we kept them together. And we had a 95% success rate on their second attempt. And if they gave excuses, we fired them. Yeah. So you have to be very, very careful about replicating an endpoint. And this is a Spotify problem. Spotify will tell you this. I've worked with them. Yet yeah, they went through a journey. The journey is constantly changing. There is not a Spotify model. Yeah? And this is a key principle of complexity theory. We start journeys. We don't attempt to achieve goals. If you start journeys with a sense of direction, you can discover novelty on the pathway. If you have a specific goal, you lose the opportunity to see things which are actually necessary as things change. Next one, confusing correlation with causation. This is the uh, major problem of all business schools. Right? Now, some of you know my first degree is philosophy and physics. Uh, that went, I was trained to have a contempt for social science from two completely different disciplines, and I haven't shaken it off since. Yeah, from a physicist's point of view, no social scientist ever has enough data to form any valid conclusion. 
And from a philosopher's point of view, social scientists are people who didn't have the intellectual power to actually handle abstract concepts, all right? But that's a, a slightly more polemical point, and I don't want to break the conference rules, so I'll make that generic, not specific, all right? Um, if, if Britain wants to increase the number of its Nobel Prizes, well, one thing they can do is not leave the European Union. Sorry, I couldn't resist that one. Um, but actually, if you take a correlation causation thing, the most effective method is to actually get all our children to eat dark chocolate. If you don't know it, dark chocolate consumption per head of population directly correlates with Nobel Prizes per head of population over the last three decades worldwide. There is obviously a very simple solution, and I intend to set up a certification scheme in how to eat dark chocolate, <laughs> together with prescribed methods for how you unwrap it and how you dispose of the contents, right, and make a lot of money. That actually has a better correlation than every single social science method I've seen. Now, the other one I love, by the way, is peaks in drowning by suicide directly correlate with the release of Nicolas Cage movies, but I can actually see a reason for that one. Right? <laughs> now, there's a whole site of these if you want to look at it. But you know the pattern. Somebody goes out and studies you know, a number of companies who've been successful. They identify things these companies do in common, and they say, do these and be successful. Everybody familiar with that? That's the recipe of approach. One of the worst examples of this is um, Lean Startup. Yeah, very popular in the Agile community, but appalling research. The guy actually goes and interviews people who he knows who were successful. That's actually bad research from a starting point of view. He actually doesn't interview the people who were unsuccessful. Now, we did that in IBM with Dorothy Leonard at Harvard. And we found all successful entrepreneurs do exactly the same things as unsuccessful entrepreneurs. They all pivot. They all do those things. The point is, you've got to market. Some people are bound to succeed. Yeah, the fact that you've got a huge number of people doing things, some will succeed. There's no recipe in that. It doesn't mean there is an interesting practice you should follow but there isn't a recipe. And then we get to the worst, which is ideology seeking evidence to support it. This is Lacroix's book, Reinventing the Organization. He has a belief about how people should organize, so he selects aspects of cases which support that belief and ignores aspects of those cases which challenge it. I mean, how many people have been laid off in Zappos and how many people's lives have been destroyed by the imposition of holacracy? The irony is all these self-organizing, self-government methods are imposed by draconian CEOs. Can't we see the hypocrisy in that? Yeah. We need some discipline in what we do. And the fact that we like something means we should be more careful about what the evidence is and how we accept it. I'll tell you one thing, I've said this many times. When I went to school, from the age of 11 to 18 in Welsh grammar schools, we actually had to stand up in front of the class every Friday and we were given a card. I still remember the first one I gave, 11 years old. I'm now wear to, allowed to wear long trousers, all right? We weren't allowed to wear long trousers until we were 11 years old, which actually meant I had to walk to primary school in the winter of 64, which was kind of like the worst in British history. To date, it will probably get worse. Um, but basically, I stood him in front of the class, and I was given a card, and it said, you support capital punishment. And I had to speak for seven minutes without preparation on something I profoundly disagree with, we did that every week from 11 to 18. That made us profoundly critical, profoundly, and actually it made us generalists because we didn't know what we were going to get hit with, so we read around the subject. And it illustrates one of the modern problems. That was a process which generated multiple benefits. We didn't try and train people to be critical. And I'm going to keep coming back to that. If you build the right interactions and the right process, you get multiple benefits. If you keep trying to train for what you think you want, you actually won't achieve it. And that's a complex point, but you need to think about that one. So those are kind of like the issues we've got. So the approach we've adopted for some time is to use natural science as a constraint on emergent practice. So we say, what do we know about systems? What do we know about human cognition? Yeah, what experiments have been repeated so we've got a stable knowledge base? And then we design methods and tools which conform with those principles. That gives us stability. It also allows us to handle uncertainty. If you're in a highly uncertain environment, even if you've got lots of cases, there won't be any help to you because the context has shifted. On the other hand, aspects of systems, aspects of human cognition do not change. Therefore, you can actually manage within those constraints. So that's the principle. It's called naturalizing sense-making. Um, it's a phrase. So I just want to run through a few of these to make the point. 
First one, and I've used this a lot, but it's still the most fundamental, is called inattentional blindness. By the way, if you see a slide which has cognitive biases on it, you should cross out the word bias and replace it with heuristic. Evolution does not produce things which don't have utility. So-called biases are not biases, they're heuristics to reduce energy consumption in collective decision-making. Yeah, and that actually means we need to work with them rather than try and prevent them. And you can't prevent them anyway. But this is my favorite. You give radiologists the backs of x-rays, you ask them to look for anomalies. On the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of an average cancer nodule. On average, 83% of radiologists don't see it, even though their eyes scan it. And more scarily, the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the 83%. That just knocks on the head any systems analyst going to do interviews. Because they will only hear what they expect to hear. And you can't train yourself not to do this. This is part of the human condition. And the reason that you do this, by the way, is the most anybody in this room scans of the available data to them is 3 to 5%. 5% is a max. If you're Chinese, it doubles, by the way. Uh, different evolutionary um, cognitive requirements based on different language styles. But for everyone in this room, 5% tops. What you then do, that triggers a set of memories of things that you did, things you've heard other people have done, things you've been trained on, and you do something called conceptual blending. You blend those fragmented memories together, and that tells you what to do. So what we do is a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. We don't even optimize. Now, the reason this works, if you think about it in evolutionary terms, the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa. If you see something large and yellow with your very sharp teeth running towards you at high speed, do you want to autistically scan all available data, look at the catalog yeah, of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and have an identified lion, check that you've actually got your lion taming master on your team in order to avoid dealing with the lion. Right? Yeah, by that time, the only document of any use to you will be the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, which is the only example I found of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore written by a survivor. Yeah? We evolved to make decisions very quickly based on a partial data scan. And just to make it more scary, most people in Agile tend towards the autistic end of a spectrum. Most people in management tend on the other direction. You are going to see more than the managers see. Yeah, and that actually is a major problem in understanding. Some of the stuff we're now doing, and I'll reference this later, is to train users to talk to IT people because it's a better strategy than training IT people to understand users. And it also distributes things in a better way. It's a more co-evolutionary approach. IT still want users to give them something which they can deliver. They're still in the manufacturing mindset. They're not in a co-evolutionary mindset. And that means increasing literacy about computer design in users is actually more important because that actually gives them agency in the systems you're delivering from. And at the moment, most agile methods remove agency from the users other than initial definition. Yeah? Okay. Next one. Sorry, I've gone through the implications, so apologies for that. Oh, no, I haven't actually, so run through that. So that's the first one, right? One of the implications is we need lots of sensors. So one of the methods I'm going to talk about, a complex a pre-scrum method or a complex method in Agile, is literally to deploy lots of small cognitively diverse teams in their spare time. You need far more cognitive diversity and perspective diversity before you firm up an opinion. And there are methods and tools for doing that. I'll go through some of them. Secondly, hindsight is not the same thing as foresight. I went through that earlier. The way you remember things is very different. You can't afford, in fact, we talk about lessons learning, not lessons learned. The work we did with the US Army with the, in, in Afghanistan was to have company commanders capture stories in real time rather than write patrol reports. Yeah, so real-time capture of learning, yet yeah, real-time stand-ups is more effective than a retrospective. A retrospective, by definition, actually filters the data to match the requirements of the present. So it's not that the ideas aren't right, but the execution is problematic. Rituals work better than rules. Um, we've done a lot of work in safety, getting lorry drivers to strap on heated belts when they get out of their lorries before they unload, 
there's a cognitive shift. Remember, you only see 5%? So from 5% associated with driving, we trigger the switch to 5% associated to loading, and we halved accidents. Don't underestimate the power of ritual to get people to see things differently. I was in an Agile conference in Lisbon earlier on this year, and we had to wear dinner jackets. I still don't believe I was in an Agile conference with a dinner jacket. All right? But by the time I'd finished putting on the dinner jacket and tying the tie, I felt differently about the world than if I was actually just casually. Conferences who insist I wear a suit have started to realize that American Airlines always lose my luggage just before I arrive at their conference. <laughs> I never feel comfortable speaking in a suit. I'm not prepared to fight it. I worked in IBM. I know you don't argue with bureaucracy. You just work around the system. Right? <laughs> the fact is, ritual is something sadly lacking in the Agile community. We don't realize its power in terms of cognitive activation. And then finally, something which people really don't get properly, which is called see, attend, act. It's a model I created some time ago. Do I see the data? Do I pay attention to the data? Well, I act on the data are three completely separate processes. And the trouble is, we all think if we present the right information with the right arguments to the right people, they will make the right decision. And sorry, that isn't the case. Whether they pay attention to it is one issue, and there are ways to do that. Whether they can act on it is another one altogether. And I'll give you a major geopolitical example of this. We did a lot, a lot of the work I did was actually done before and after 9-11. I was actually in the Pentagon the day before 9-11 in the bit which got hit. Uh, that was the counter-terrorism program. And I flew out that night, gave a lecture in Warwick while the, the towers were going down, wondering whether my team was still alive or not. Yeah? And then we worked extensively for the next few years. One of the things we did was a complete one-week retrospective on 9-11 from a complexity perspective. And we had the whole of Clinton's Al-Qaeda team there, including Gore for a week in the Blue Mountains. There are worse places to spend a week than in the Blue Mountains with some very intelligent people talking about serious issues, all right? It was, it was a really good week. Now, one of the things which came out of that, if you don't know it, there was, a there was a presidential order which would have been signed by Gore if he hadn't been displaced by a judicial coup. Sorry, can't, you've got to work on that one, all right, guys? Stay awake, all right? Um, which would have had F-14s in permanent patrol above Washington, New York, with authorization to, hide, to shoot down hijacked civilian aircraft. The Clinton White House had worked out Al-Qaeda's strategy. It was obvious from the Paris and that the, you know, we, we knew that strategy. It was dismissed by Bush as typical Clinton al paranoia about Al-Qaeda, which, to be honest, was a reasonable position at the time. I'm not going to argue he was wrong. At the, given the evidence, it was a reasonable position. And I remember asking Gore, would you have actually signed that order? And he said, actually, probably not. Because to authorize military aircraft to shoot down civilian aircraft after 9-11 is a brain dead decision. To do it before, the history is very different. It's a history of failure. And we don't realize that our users and executives are facing political decisions and consequences which we are not aware of and we don't attend to. You need to be aware of that, those three. You need to think about each distinctly in a system design. Will they see it? Will they pay attention to it? Well, they act if they see attention to it. And they're separate processes. And they need, that needs to be built into all design principles at the moment. Next one, how many people have got children? Yeah, yeah there are people now here young enough to be my children, which is deeply depressing, right? Sorry, Kat, all right? But you're the same age as my daughter, right? Um, OK. One of the things, when you actually, um, you tell them bedtime stories, do you tell them about how Janet and John, or Dick and Jane, in respect for our American um, companions here, stay at home, do what mummy and daddy says, achieve the family KPIs, and get the appropriate certificates in house cleaning and other aspects of the way we work? You don't do that, do you? Yeah, they, they actually disobey parental instructions, they go into the wild woods, they meet witches and wolves and other strange beasts, all right? Uh, we have a happy ending because we want them to sleep at night, but 90% of the story is doom, disaster, and failure. We actually like stories with failure. Your brain imprints failure faster than it imprints success. Because avoidance of failure is a more successful evolutionary strategy than imitation of success. Every time you build a best practice system or you spread best practice, you make things worse, not better. We actually build worse practice systems for company and micro-scenario-based systems in which we generate multiple scenarios of failure, and we ask people how they would avoid it. 
One of the ways that you do the steam alignment is you don't have these anodyne platitude in the statements about we're going to be one team united in common purpose, we will respect the customers. I mean, how many times can you recycle these platitudes with any real meaning? What we actually do is we define the stories of what we don't want to be. It's much easier to align a team saying, well, we don't want to be like that and we don't want to be like that. And it gives you more freedom for exploration within the system. And that's how the whole human storytelling tradition has emerged. It doesn't tell you what you should be. It gives you the lessons of what doesn't work so you can avoid that in the future. And that switch from best practice to worst practice to boundaries based on what we shouldn't want is another aspect of resilience. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like in the implications here. Yeah. Um, Abstraction is also key here. If you don't know it, painting and music came before language and human evolution. That's actually very significant. It means human language is based on abstractions, not on naming things. It's not about the material. The reason this is powerful, by the way, and the reason it evolved from primitive sketches to the glories of Wagnerian opera, sorry, I should display my own prejudices here, yeah? Um, and if you don't know about the Tristan Chord, you really need to read about the Tristan Chord to understand where Agile has got to go. Now, the Tristan called in opera is unresolved tension. Just start to think about that, right? If we could create a state of unresolved tension, we'd have more resilient systems than if everything is resolved up front. Yeah? But basically, abstraction allows us to invent. Art allows us to move away from the material so we can make completely novel connections between things. It's the danger with STEM education is we're driving invention out of the educational system because we're driving the very things which make us human by an over-focus on maths and engineering and an under-focus on the humanities and art. And again, ironically, it's really bad science to actually do that. And finally, on this failure games, we were on simulation games. You can tell I grew up doing my maths homework to Star Trek, the first series. Yeah? In whatever you do, you fail. Over three rounds, with three teams working in parallel, Everything you do makes things worse. Now, the irony on that is we end up with people scanning 20 to 30 times more data at the end of the process than if they succeed. Failure increases learning and scanning. Success reduces it. Games in which you can win are actually very bad for management and development. Games in which you lose is where the learning takes place. That's called anthro simulation. And sometimes, by the way, we actually do that in science fiction environments. Again, my background. Then we come on to complexity. How many people know about complexity theory? How many people know about the Kinevin framework? OK, I'm going to run over that fairly quickly, because I, doubtless Liz or somebody will explain it much better than I do later. Right? Um, complexity theory is about systems which are multi many entangled. Alicia Gerardo has a lovely phrase for this. She says, a complex system is like bramble bushes in a fifth thicket. Yeah, you know there are separate parts, but they're so entangled, you can't actually change things. And if you pull something, you will have unintended consequences. The one thing you can say with absolute certainty about a complex adaptive system is whatever you do will have unintended consequences. Yeah? My favorite way of illustrating by this way and think about it in design is anybody remember the NHS patient record system? Yeah, the largest ever disaster in the history of government procurement of IT. That's a really high bar to have crossed. We should be really proud of a nation to be in first position on that. Right? Um, I was on the IBM bid team for it. And I got thrown off the IBM bid team because I said we should no bid and put in a non-compliant bid. Because anything which tries to design every, uh, something that complex up front is going to have multiple unintended consequences. Centralized database for confidential data, multiple hardware input, yeah, multiple agencies. You can just see the complexities increasing and increasing. Either way, we all know what happened. The one unintended consequence I love is that they had to put credit card type things in for privacy, which made the hardware more expensive and slowed it down. And in A&E, you can't afford for every person in an A team to be putting a credit card into the computer to get access to data. That was a systems analyst who was coming from a different perspective. So the senior physician put their credit card in at the start of the day, left it in all day. Reception got to hear about this, so they hijacked the, part, the, the medical records of a pop star and sold it to the son. I could go on. 
Yeah, it eventually collapsed. The alternative design we put in, and this illustrates complexity design, we said actually the database should be distributed. Everybody should carry their medical around, records around with them, either on a credit card or an implanted chip with a small tattoo on top of it, which if I've got a chronic condition, I'll do. I want people to know I've got a condition. And then all we have to do is invest in common reader technology with all the medical systems so that your records carry with you on your last contact in the medical system. I know that, by the way, 30% of the records we don't need to computerize because, sorry about this, all those guys are going to die within the next five years anyway, and their records are already being carried with them in manual form. And then we see what patterns emerge, and we, then we write more code to stabilize the emergent patterns. And now that's a complex system design method that's actually been used in three countries since. You change the granularity of your primary, identity, your primary entities and you change the interaction model and you see what happens. And that's an emergent design. And the reason you do that is there are so many entanglements, you can't design a successful system. You have to change the system and see what happens as a result. And that's a complex adaptive system. Now from that, we get the Kinevian framework and I'm going to do it fairly quickly because I don't want to go into a full Kinevin system on this. Yeah. Sorry. What I actually want to do is to use it for where I think Agile needs to go, which is multiple methods but with common interfaces. Yeah, I'm still quite fond of object orientation. I was on Corbett committees back for the last century. Yeah, and I always argued then that people are objects too. If you can define the right identity, you have polymorphism, you have inheritance, you have input-output then you see how things interact and systems stabilize from that. So from my point of view, what we need is a multi-methods approach, but we need to define how the methods interact with each other. So this is one attempt to actually do that using Kinevin. Yeah. So Kinevin looks like this. It does not look like this with that being drawn afterwards to make me happy, all right? Just to be clear, all right? I'm getting less happy about those. It defines four domains. One is where the relationship between cause and effect is obvious, where it's complicated, where it's complex, and where it's chaotic. Now, the simple way of describing this is in an obvious domain, it's like if I go outside and pick up a car, I drive on the left-hand side of the road because I'm in England. If I'm in the States, I drive on the right-hand side of the road. Yeah? It's a very simple categorization thing. I'm in this country, it's one of those which drives on the left, therefore I drive on the left. And the whole point about obvious is everybody can see the relationship between cause and effect, and everybody accepts it's the right way to do. That's the key aspect. In a complicated system, the experts may know what it's the right thing is to do. So, for example, anybody driven the Orfini Coast? Okay, I'll give you a nice tip. You know, I have, I've studied this now, I've actually seen the scientific studies on this. Italian drivers south of Naples flock. They don't drive by the rules. So if you want to drive south of Naples, follow the next car, match speed, avoid collision, and life is stress-free. Yeah, actually follow the rules and everything will go wrong. I'll never forget in Naples slowing down when the traffic light went to red and I caused a mass pileup behind me because the Italian rule is, well, you've got five seconds to get across so everybody speeds up and it was... One of those areas of Naples, you don't want to get out of a car, so I got out fairly fast, right? The point about this is an expert knows what to do, but the decision maker doesn't. For the decision maker, it isn't self-evident. So they have to do analysis or bring in expertise to find it. Now, both of those, that's a sort of phenomenological divide, it's a gradient. But then you go into a phase shift into complexity and a phase shift into chaos. So if you overstructure a system which can't naturally be structured, it becomes chaotic. And I've got lots of examples from that from when I worked with IBM. My favorite one is we were acquired by IBM. Uh, I didn't volunteer, I was conscripted. And the first thing they did was to charge us for coffee and ban alcohol. Now, this is completely unreasonable. I mean, you're all software developers. You know the coffee alcohol cycle is critical to quality software development, right? Nobody should be expected to speak to users without alcohol first. You then need coffee to sober up to write the code then you need even more alcohol because no, users never want what you can prove they asked for, they want something else instead. I'll come back to that one later as well. Either way, that was bad enough, all right? I had to smuggle whiskey out of my office, yeah, because it, otherwise it would have been confiscated, right? It was like being back in school. 
Um, and we had to have private coffee arrangements in hidden areas of the office. Fortunately, we were a secure establishment and none of IBM HR were ever cleared for security. So we always dashed through the doors and had coffee, all right? There are ways around these things if you play with it. Then it got even worse. They banned us from buying food for staff. All right? Now, I'm now a C-level executive, all right? And just to tell you, do not get promoted, all right? As you get promoted, you meet angrier and angrier customers. All right? The higher you go up the management chain, the less joy you have because you bastards keep all the happy customers for yourself and only pass on the unhappy ones to us, all right? And you always do it too late for us to do anything anyway, all right? Uh, good people escalate early, bad people escalate too late. Either way, so I, and we learned by now, you didn't argue with IBM bureaucrats logically, that never worked. Yeah, kind of like they always had a reason for it. The only thing which occasionally worked was a Socratic technique. You get trained on this in philosophy. You ask people questions till they contradict themselves. It's highly enjoyable, uh, but you have to remember that people of Athens got so fed up with it that they voted for Socrates to commit suicide. So there, there, you need to be cautious on this. So I said, look, last night I got called out. Three o'clock in the morning I got the call, and in the office at four o'clock we've got a VAX cluster down. I didn't say the reason the thing is down is because you idiots cancelled the training budget saying that systems programmers could work from the manual on an upgrade. Uh, that was the actual reason why I did a drains up. So forget that, all right? Yeah, you're not going to argue that one. I said, you know, we've got to get it up by 9 a.m. because it's got a 999 service on it. And the penalty clauses are massive. And I said, the only thing I can do is keep people away from the systems programmers where they try and boot the system up again. Because the last thing they want is people asking them how they're doing or what they're doing because then they won't be able to do it. A tip, by the way, for anybody in application software support, if you have a software support problem, allocate one of your team to phone the client up every 20 minutes and give them a meaningless task. It is the most successful strategy for giving you time to solve the real problem. Right? If you just focus on the problem, that won't work. So I said, all I can do is keep people away from them. I've got to buy them pizza and coke to keep them awake. So what am I going to do? They looked slightly worried at that point, and I realized it could have been misinterpreted. So I said, I do mean Coca-Cola. <laughs> did give us some ideas, but they did show some relief at that point. Um, and then they said, OK, we understand this may occasionally be necessary. You can do this if you get vice presidential approval 48 hours in advance. Now, at this point, you think, oh my god, but you mustn't react. This is a Socratic process. I've been trained on this for five years of my life, right? You say, that's brilliant. We would never have thought of that. This is one of the benefits of joining IBM. Then you realize that sarcasm and irony are deadly weapons. We used to switch them on and off with HTML code in side chats during conference calls, right? Um, I said, what happens on the very rare occasion where we don't get 48 hours notice of a crisis? And then they said yes in a way which means no. They said country general manager approval after the event. If you work for IBM, that means your expenses will go into South Bank, they'll never be signed, and if you complain, your name will appear on the wrong lists. And you don't want to be on those lists every quarter end when they're looking at utilization figures. So the practice emerged, I hasten to add, I never did this and nobody I knew ever did this, I want this to be very clear, of over-tipping London taxi drivers. If you over-tip a London taxi driver, so I'm told, you get a blank receipt. The blank receipt was then completed for the amount of money spent on the pizza and coke, a parallel set of books were kept, and the responsible manager took a taxi and claimed for a bus. Sorry, took a bus and claimed for a taxi, get it the right way around. Now, as I say, I heard about this. You know, I gave this example at Scrum Alliance conference 15, no, 10 years ago, I think, in Berlin. And three people from IBM ran up to me afterwards and showed me their wallets with blank receipts and said, we're still doing that. Did you invent it? <laughs> if you over-constrain a system which isn't naturally constrainable, people will work around the system. If you build systems which are over-constrained, people will work around the system. The only thing which is safe and safe at the moment is good people will make it work despite its structure. Because we actually like to make things work. The trouble is we don't make, if that's not visible, if we over constrain, everything goes wrong, you get catastrophic failure. Now used correctly, chaos is useful. So let's look at this in the context of Agile. And this is where I bring in the latest version of Kinevin, which is the liminal version. And that actually adds some domains. So it adds a liminal domain between complex and chaotic, and a liminal domain, sorry, being complex and complicated, and a liminal domain into chaos. 
For Kinevin experts, it also resolves the unorder problem, but I'm not going to deal with that today. Yeah? Now, this liminality is key. Liminality is a state of suspended transition. It comes from anthropology. Yeah, when you put on a mask in a primitive, so-called primitive ritual, there's a state of suspended transition between being who you are and being what the mask represents. Yeah, so that's liminality, a state of suspended transition. Now, if we look at that in the context of Agile, then we can start to position tools and techniques. So Scrum fits here. What Scrum does, it does a series of linear iterations based on a need which is partially defined and delivers a result. Yeah? That's a liminal technique. The huge power of Scrum is that it shifts complex to complicated, not that it stays in the complex. That's why it's valuable, because it produces sustainable, reusable code. Yeah? And it has an iterative cycle to do it. But it iterates in a linear way, which means it's not a truly complex technique. It's a liminal one. Now, again, Scrum is one of the most powerful techniques we've created. I'm advocating it very strongly, but I'm saying it's not the whole of the universe. Yeah, we need to do things around and about it. There's actually nothing wrong whatsoever with waterfall. Yeah, I was working with Telstra in Australia. They had infrastructure teams. Look at the work. I mean, Martin and also the Google guys are all saying at the moment, Scrum doesn't work for large infrastructure projects. It works for short cycle consumer related projects. But they had to do huge telecoms infrastructure projects, which are waterfall. They know what they've got to deliver. They know the resource. They're two-year programs. But nobody got promoted in Telstra unless they were agile, because it's a cult. So they created one-year sprints. <laughs> People will work around your over-formal system. So nothing wrong with waterfall. And anybody remember time boxes? Yeah. Why have we abandoned time boxes? You guarantee a delivery, but you vary the resource, or you vary the delivery. It's a very powerful technique, yeah, because actually it gives the user certainty within boundaries. Yeah, Scrum is actually a, a time box variant, but it's a very specific variant. There's a richer technique. So that's me just doing some positioning. But now we need some more stuff over here. So three things we're working on here, and I'll run through them. Yeah? One is called triplets, or trios. Three is a very stable human system. You all know that. If you go out to dinner with strangers, if it's one stranger, there's a lot of tension. If it's three, you can relax more, yeah? because the burden isn't there. Now, we've been pioneering this in citizen engagement. So for example, in the South Wales Valleys, we use something I call the grandparent syndrome. Grandparents will tell things to grandchildren. They won't tell to children and vice versa. There are evolutionary reasons for that and power reasons for that. So basically, instead of having outside experts generate change, we said to any child, you can come along to a hackathon to learn how to use the software, the ethnographic software, but you have to bring somebody from your grandparents' generation with you, and the pair of you have to come up with new ideas. So we have the idealism of youth with the pragmatism, the social network of the old. I've seen so many youth parliaments where people come together, they have idealistic solutions, nobody implements it, they get disillusioned. So we want to avoid that. So we ended up with about 15 or 16 of those duos going out. Anybody came up with a good idea got put in a threesome with somebody from local or national government who could make their ideas happen. And we ended up with transformatory projects in the Welsh Valleys which involved no expenditure because we use the natural resources of the local community. Right. Now we're now moving out in IT. You put a young, bright coder who's good at prototyping together with somebody who sees the system as a whole. Systems architect and system tester. Testers are actually not involved early enough in the design cycle, to my point of view. Somebody who has to test it should be involved up front because they see the bigger picture. And we put them in a trio with a user who's trained to talk to IT people. If you want to know how we do that, we're repurposing so your child has got Asperger's syndrome booklets because that's what it's about. You have to produce structured information. You mustn't introduce new information until the old information has been absorbed. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this because if you have to design a system, you have to see things like that, otherwise they go wrong. But users need to understand that so they can communicate better. So we can now throw 15 or 20 trios at a problem over two weeks generate multiple small prototypes, 
and the ones which users like go into Scrum. You see the principle here? We're radically increasing diversity at very low cost so that we avoid that cognitive blindness. The other one, this is one of the technique I developed for DSTM years ago. In fact, I think I sketched it out in that pub in Cheltenham, which is called Triple Eight. Anybody remember JAD? We've all forgotten JAD as well. Yeah, joint application design is a very successful, highly documented technique by which you put users together with prototypers in a one or two day session and you build something which they can play with which tests understanding. Okay, didn't go on for long. Now that's actually a powerful technique. So what we did is we do a JAD session in Farnborough, that's where we were based. We then take the working prototype that comes out of that, we threw it over to a team in Mumbai without access to the original client requirements and said, what can you do to improve this? Then eight hours later, they sent it on to a team in San Jose, again without the requirements, and said, what can you do to improve this? The next morning, it came back to the users. Every time we've done that, the users said, God, I wouldn't have thought of that. Can I please have it? What we're introducing is forced mutation in a short cycle to avoid cognitive bias. That technique's I've, under high pressure to document that at the moment, by the way, as a lot of people are picking that one up. It's a very effective technique before you dive in because it explores more possibilities. You see the sort of complexity principles? And the other thing which we're doing, which if anybody's interested in, come talk with me, is mapping unarticulated needs. Because actually, users don't know what to ask for because IT is progressing faster than users can create demand. So what we've got to start to do, and we've now worked out the mechanics of this, and we're starting the experiments, is you do continuous capture of user frustrations on an ethnographic basis with them as self-ethnographers. As significant clusters come together in those, you put a prototyping team on, and you say, would this help? That's IT becoming strategic rather than responsive. At the moment, IT responds to needs defined by users. It doesn't go the other way around. And again, that's coming back to the coeval approach. So those are some examples. One of the things we want to do is to start to define other methods and tools within the framework with how they interact with others. Because if you see what I've done, I've created three techniques which feed into Scrum. Yeah, I improve the input or the output, and that gives you a multi-methods type approach. So, moving on. That also allows people to use different tools. The one size fit all doesn't work. I'm an enthusiastic amateur carpenter. All the furniture in our house I built. Yeah? It's the one thing in my life which ever gets completed. I think that's why I like it. And I got taught by my father. We built three boats together. It was four years before he let me put in a screw unassisted. I can still remember the point where he left the garage and I was allowed to do something without supervision. Right? So I haven't done that with my own son. Consequences, I'm building his new shelves in his new house at the moment. That's the downside of this. All right? But the basic fact is the tools I've got fit my hands. The essence of a good tool is when you pick it up, it fits your hand. You don't have to think about it. If you have to buy or re-engineer your hand or go through a certification course to use a tool, there's something wrong with it. Yeah? People need to be able to use tools appropriate to themselves, their team, their context, their cognitive style. Not any tools, but we need some sort of balance within it. And there are three basic principles of complex systems design. Sorry, it's me playing with the new transitions. All right? You can tell the new slides because they've got fancier transitions. Right? Um, the first one is optimize the granularity. This is one of the most important things you do in a complex system. It's what are you dealing with? Remember my patient records example? The best unit there is the patient and their records, not the database. Generally, this means reduce the granularity. If you do an organizational design, teams of 5, 15, or 150 have different dynamics than teams of more than 150. Working with smaller units is better than working with bigger units. You've got more flexibility. So the first principle is get the granularity right. That will involve some experimentation. Second principle, distribute and diversify the cognition. You need multiple perspectives, multiple backgrounds, multiple views, and you need that in near real time. You can't afford for a small group of people because they won't see the gorilla in the x-rays, and that's a threat and the opportunity. So you need cognitive diversity. Next one is you need to disintermediate the decision makers. Yeah? Now, that's actually quite important. It's why I don't like things like story points and epics, because they increase the mediation between the coder and the user experience. 
is if you take user experience and you restrict it, you summarize it, you're actually taking away things which the coder might realize are significant. What we do with senior executives is they can go directly from an abstract representation of the space to the stories told by consumers without any interpretive layers. That actually is empowering as well because it means that the voice of the consumer gets heard at the top of the power chain. It's not actually filtered all the way through the process. So if you just, you know, very simple, granularity, cognition, disintermediation, those are the three principles of design. Now, within that, we get this key concept on granularity. And this is where we come to the scaling issue. My argument with SAFE has not been about what the method is. It's fundamentally, it doesn't understand how to scale a complex adaptive system. It's wrong a priori, not a posteriori. It's wrong in principle. You can only scale a complex adaptive system by decomposition and recombination. You think about DNA? All of the complex complexity of organic life form comes from reassembling four chemicals. And to scale a complex system, you don't aggregate or imitate. You decompose and recombine. Yeah, and that's actually critical, and that's kind of like what I've been talking about before, but we extend that now into organizational design. And the sort of missing link on this for some time has been scaffolding. That's a sculpture in Welsh slate, by the way. It's been the missing link, all right? Um, it's the thing which has been holding me back from producing the book because we have to have something that you design. And you can't, in a complex system, design the endpoint. So for the last year, we've been working with a whole bunch of academics and practitioners um, in some quite nice locations, all right? I mean, Whistler, um, Tasmania, Snowdonia, all right? We, you know, we use mountain lodges in off-season. Uh, theoretically, it's because it's cheaper. In practice, it's because I can make people do dawn walks up a garn. Yeah, early in the morning, yeah? And I'll give you the names of the people who didn't make it past the Nidwell if you want later, because some of them are key figures in the Agile movement. And I'm prepared to name and shame, but you'll have to buy me a few drinks first, all right? Um, what we've actually been working on is a new approach to design thinking. That actually contains two key, three key elements, distributed ethnography and distributed ideation. Most current design thinking is a linear approach, ideation, you know, ethnography, ideation, design, we're distributing both and working in real time. Yeah, and there's going to be courses on this coming up next year with myself and Jay Bloom. He's been working with us on it. But the other element is scaffolding. And what we've been developing is effectively a typology of scaffolding. Now, I want to make this clear. I'm trying to get people to understand. How many people know the difference between a typology and a taxonomy? OK, right. Now, this is really important to understand. Right? And then Simon can get me right on commoditization because I keep getting it wrong and he keeps correcting me, all right? Um, and I want you to pronounce something for me in a minute, Simon, so I'm getting ready for this one. A taxonomy is a rigid set of structures. It's the two by two matrix. The problem with taxonomies, well, the advantage of taxonomies is it's clear. It's one of these, we do that. The disadvantage are the boundary conditions. If something is in the boundary, you make it fit regardless. Yeah, and the other problem with taxonomy is it rhymes with taxidermy and it produces similar effects. Right? <laughs> a typology is multiple perspective ways of looking at things without boundaries. So you look at things from different perspectives, but you don't assume rigid boundaries. Kinevin, when it's created as a typology, once it's been actually contextualized to an organization, it becomes a taxonomy, but it can go backwards and forwards between the steps. People often don't get that. They treat it as a taxonomy, it starts as a typology. That's called four points as a method. Right? So this is important. So what we've been developing is a typology. So the first is either steel or bamboo scaffolding. There's a difference between the two. Steel scaffolding goes outside a building. Yeah, and kind of like you know what the building is going to be. There's not much variation, but it provides a scaffolding while boats should produce the building. Bamboo is actually more flexible. Yeah, it can actually adapt it very quickly in the time. You can change the scaffolding if you want to do something different on the building. But there's a high skill in bamboo scaffolding. You see the bamboo scaffolders, God, they're skilled. Yeah, whereas steel scaffolding can be trained very quickly. Right? So those are external scaffolding. Then it gets more interesting. This is also external. This is a type of lattice they put over a burn on your skin. And it provides a structure around which the skin can regrow. But the nutrients feed into the skin, and the scaffolding dissolves once it's done its job. 
Right? Now, that's sort of external and internal. It's a transitionary one. Then we get to microcardial ones. These are really fascinating. These are collagen things that they put on your heart. And they literally dissolve into the heart, and they leave microelectrical filaments in your heart when they find the right place for those filaments to be. Now, this is actually brilliant sorts of technology, but you can see what I'm doing with the metaphor here. You put something in place which will find its natural location over time rather than you having to do it or doing intrusive operations. That's an internal scaffolding. Yeah? Then we get what we call dark scaffolding or shadow scaffolding. This comes from Anne Pendleton Julian. If you haven't read her book on design with John Seeley Brown, I really recommend it. This is Living in a White Water World. This is extreme sports. You can't design the structure for extreme sports from scratch. It has to evolve over decades. Because the technology has to change, the practice has to change, the training has to change. It's an evolutionary process, and all you can do is trigger the evolution, but then you've got a complex infrastructure which supports extreme activity. And then finally on this, you get the keystone, which is good or bad. This is the most stable form of architecture we know. You know. Once the keystone is in place, the whole thing stands. The problem you've got is if you've got multiple layers of keystones, if you go to the catacombs in Rome, there's about 15 layers of arches. You remove the wrong keystone at the wrong time, everything collapses. Think legacy system code. So this kind of like goes in a circle. And it goes from exto to endoskeleton. So an external skeleton, you have a lot of structure, but the thing doesn't scale. Now, all those movies about giant ants, guys, it won't happen. Yeah? Because an exoskeleton is limited in size. We have endoskeletons, a common structure, but large variety. So the principle now of system design is you look at the level of uncertainty, you choose and build the scaffolding type, you define the interactions within the scaffolding, and you see what emerges. And this, for our point of view, is what we're now working on, the next generation of systems architecture, yeah? together with supporting tools. And I've just started a blog post on this, and I need Simon to teach me how to pronounce this, because I still can't pronounce it. Right? But he's a microbiologist, so if he doesn't know, God help the rest of us. But I'm giving him notice to get ready for lunchtime on this. Right? Um, a microconsia is a symbiosis between fungus and a green plant. Basically, green plants only survive because there are huge microfungal layers which actually connect them, but they're messy. So this series I'm writing is a key element of scaffolding. It's how do you manage the shadow or informal organization? Because the shadow or the informal organization is the most important part of your overall system, and there's a series of five blog posts coming out on this. So that leads me finally into dispositions, and this kind of like leads into it. This is one of the other gaping void cartoons I like. His best ever cartoon, by the way, is same cross, different nails. Yeah, just start to think about that one. That's very clever, right? Um, everybody talks about culture, and then they try and design culture. You can't do that. Culture is an emergent property of multiple interactions over time. You can't say, we have this sort of culture. So you have to design it. And one of the ways you do that is to map what it is. So this is a dispositional map. This is the sort of thing you get, because what we now do, and this is stuff we did joint develop with Gaping Void, we work with a lot of the Agile founders, from the Agile Manifesto and Agile practitioners. We created a series of Gaping Void cartoons which describe the state of Agile. You'll love them when you see them. Yeah, we give you six of them. All of your employees choose the one which they think represents Agile in your company. They tell a story about why, a scenario about the future, and they index it. And from that, we draw these maps. It's an actual map from a test, and you can immediately see we've got an issue because we've got multiple microcultures with limited overlaps. And so what you start to do is to say, how can we change that? Well, you, the way you change it is if your desire is to be here, then these people are too far away. You've got to move them there first. These people, you've got to move here. These there. And that's actually where you look at the stories they've told in response to the cartoon they've chose, and say, how can we create more stories like these and fewer stories like those? And that is a whole new theory of change. Instead of saying we want to be X, we want to be safer, people say we already are safe. Instead of saying we want to be more agile, we already are agile. You say we want more stories like these and fewer stories like that, what ideas have you got? 
And from that, we get a new type of KPI, which is a vector measure, which measures direction, speed of travel for intensity of effort. And that replaces outcome-based targets in a complex system. Because in a complex system, you can't define outcome, but you can define the direction you want to travel. We start journeys rather than achieve goals. So, to pull this together, I'm coming back to being slightly cynical. I have a reputation for cynical curmudgeon, and I'm proud of it, all right? It's one of the men, that, yeah, lots of C's in complexity, but cynicism and curmudgeon nature are part of the two behaviorals. We actually need to think about authenticity in this system, and we also need to start to think about the type of system we're building. So I started off with dogs. I want to finish with cats. Yeah, this is Rudyard Kipling. Anybody read the Just So stories? Yeah, if you can ever get the David Davis Children's Hour recordings of these, they're the best, all right? This is, I am the cat who walked by himself and all places are alike unto me. Uh, there's the other one, how the elephant got his trunk, the great, gray, green, greasy, limpopo. You can tell how this was part of my childhood. I still remember them, all right? The cat, the dog is tamed, the horse is tamed, the cow is tamed by early man, an early woman. Early woman does magic. Man doesn't do much in the stories, actually. It's quite interesting um, if you actually read them with a the shoulder blade. Right? And the cat wants the milk and it wants the warmth, but it doesn't want to be tamed. So it does a bargain and it tricks by looking after the baby. And eventually it's allowed to have access to the cave, but it's also allowed to go wild. And it goes, and this is the final factor of it. We need agile to be more like cats than dogs. And just to be really wicked on this, cat owners understand complexity, dog owners are trying to get rid of it. You know, dogs have masters, cats have slaves, all right? That's the way it works. If you want to test some of these ideas, this is a site we've just set up for climate change. Because the other big thing, and this is the final point I want to make to you, is big changes never work in a complex system, small changes too. So much as I would like to scare you shitless with the consequences of global warming and they're really scary, all that would do was mean you wouldn't do anything. A few people would do something, but most of you wouldn't. What we're focused on here is finding the small stories by which people can make a difference because if enough people do small things, the bigger things will be possible. So if you want to contribute that, you're welcome. If you want to create a specific site for a group you're working with, we'll create specific sites for this. And they're already being translated. There's a volunteer community translating them into different languages. So we've got English, we've got Spanish, we've got German, we've got Romanian, we've got Ukrainian. Yeah, anybody wants to throw in, we'll actually want to set up a site as a community asset. So make Agile wild. But don't make it so wild, it can't be used. But don't make it so tame, it becomes anodyne. And scale by recombination, not by aggregation. Thank you very much for your time.